So hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today, wherever you are in the world. My name is Brian Motherway from the International Energy Agency, and we're delighted to welcome you to the next in our series of webinars on themes related to people-centered clean energy transitions. We've been holding a number of these events, and we have plenty more planned, so you can find the details of those on our website. But today is one I'm particularly pleased about, I must say, in terms of the topic, but also the really excellent speakers we have lined up. So I'll be telling you more about those in a few minutes. But first of all, it's a particular honor for me to introduce, to say some opening remarks, the Deputy Executive Director of the IEA, Mary Burst Warlick. So Mary, thank you for joining us today and the floor is now yours. Well, thank you so much, Brian. Um, it's, uh, I'd like to begin by saying a very warm welcome to all of you from all around the world who um, have taken the time to join our event. I really want to thank all of the panelists um, for uh, joining us today for this very important discussion. The IEA believes that the clean energy transition is a opportunity to address longstanding gender disparities in energy deployment, access, and many other dimensions of energy and climate. Open dialogue and exchanges such as the one we are hosting here today are really vital to ensure that we're actively, proactively working to address these issues. I believe it's vital that we put a stronger focus uh, on examining the evidence as to how clean energy policies affect both men and women and what policies have been most successful in addressing gender issues in particular. Here at the IEA, we've undertaken a number of steps to ensure our agency, along with our member governments and partners, can be at the forefront uh, of narrowing the gender imbalances in the energy sector. The IEA, uh, for example, has established a high level gender advisory council. This occurred in June of 2021. And since that time, the council's met five times. It has helped bring together our members um, to help put a clear focus on gender issues. The council was established with the core objective um, to provide the IEA with an official platform and framework to discuss and advise on gender equality, diversity, and mainstreaming, both at the IEA secretariat and in energy policy making uh, systems and environments for all of our member governments. Another aim of the council is to strengthen collaboration across related international initiatives, including the Equality in Energy Transitions Initiative, um, which is an IEA collab, um, technology collaboration program and clean energy ministerial initiative and the Equal by 30 campaign. The council has enabled us to explore and advise on issues across the full spectrum of gender policies in the energy sector. Of course, as a data-driven organization, we are avid supporters of ensuring that there is accurate data collection and tracking progress to uh, enable evidence-based policy analysis. And as a direct result of our Gender Advisory Council and the collaboration with the Equality in Energy Initiative, we've been able to develop our Gender and Energy Data Explorer. The Explorer contains a broad range of the available gender-related data for the energy sector. From the rates of gender balance in decision-making, entrepreneurship and innovation to whether men and women face similar employment opportunities through our analysis of wage gaps, our explorer shines a light on these issues to help policymakers strengthen their policies and measures. The explorer has received very positive feedback and I encourage you, all of you to take a look at it. And in order to develop the content and um, uh, robustness to our data, we're always looking to expand our dialogues, not only with countries, but with partner organizations such as the UN, the World Bank, the ILO, and of course, our OECD colleagues. We believe that proactive cooperation is key to ensuring that we can access all existing gender data and collectively work together to look at new methodologies that will enhance the data availability on gender-oriented outputs for the energy sector. But beyond data and metrics, we at the IEA are actively encourage all governments to mainstream gender equality and diversity in their energy policy making. We question, for example, what are the key policy levers that drive 
um, an inclusive and gender equitable energy transition. And we ask, how do policies impact men and women differently? And what can governments do specifically to uh, better enhance gender parity in the labor force? Now to address these pressing issues, we've recently begun a new initiative, which gathers knowledge and data to develop policy recommendations and assist governments in their ambitions to improve gender diversity in the energy sector. This information combined with our Gender and Energy Data Explorer not only enables us to track the progress on gender mainstreaming within energy policies, but it allows us to release periodic updates and develop policy recommendations for governments and industry. Now, as a part of the IEA's work stream on people-centered clean energy transitions, we're hosting today's webinar to help draw upon the uh, experiences of our panelists, uh, of course, who are very much at the forefront of these issues, examining and implementing gender mainstreaming energy practices within their communities, organizations, and governments. As clean energy transitions progress around the world, we should not lose sight of the major opportunities they present to address some of these historical imbalances faced by our societies. Through hosting sessions such as today's event, we at the IEA hope to provide a platform which shines a light on some of the many gender dimensions and key people-centered issues at the heart of the transition of our energy systems. At the IEA, we truly are serious about addressing this topic and we aim to provide our member countries and partners with the necessary information to take tangible steps towards mainstreaming gender parity in the energy sector and in all aspects of clean energy transitions. So I'm really very much looking forward to today's discussion, uh, to hearing from our panelists and their insights uh, when it comes to building inclusive and gender equitable energy futures. So thank you so much and welcome once again. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you for those opening remarks. And, and as Mary has said, uh, friends and colleagues, this is a part, a part of ongoing dialogue and exchange, which we really value in terms of getting a better understanding of these issues, and particularly a topic like uh, gender equality, which gets mentioned a lot in clean energy transitions. But what does that really mean? What's actually happening on the ground? What are we learning from real experience? And, and we have a range of perspectives a uh, very deep experience and knowledge from different parts of the world that we're going to benefit from hearing from today to probe that. And I'm going to uh, just say as well that if any of the colleagues joining us on Zoom wish to input into the debate or ask a question, feel free to do that in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. And if we have time, certainly we can put some of your questions to the panelists as we proceed. Our style is discursive here, so we're going to go to the panelists. I'll introduce you uh, to them as we turn to them, uh, and we will hear from them all, uh, hopefully a number of times during the course of a fluid discussion over the next uh, little bit more than an hour we have. So let me turn straight away to our first speaker. Uh, let's go to Zambia, where we have uh, a face that's probably familiar to many people here because she's a, a doyen of this uh, sector for many years uh, and a real global leader in this. It's Sheila Aparocha, who is the director of Energia, the International Network on Gender and Sustainable Energy. Uh, and a lot of you will know this network. It operates in Africa and Asia, looking at energy access, human development questions, and of course, putting women at the center of its efforts. Sheila, we're delighted to have you with us today. And maybe because of your broad experience in this sector, I could ask you to help us for everybody frame these questions. So what, what do you think are the key gender issues at the heart of clean energy transition? Thank you so much and greetings to all. Uh, thank you to the IA for inviting me to join this distinguished panel. Uh, to start with, let me just compliment uh, the uh, intervention from the previous speakers and also what you have said yourself, uh, uh, Mr. Moderator. I do feel that it is important that there is agreement on what type of energy transition we're aiming for. From the perspective of the uh, Gender and Energy Compact, that is a multi-stakeholder coalition convened by Unido Energia and the Global Women's Network for Energy Transition, that brings together 10 governments and over 75 civil society, uh, private sector, academia, youth and international organizations. It is clear to us that the energy transition has to be one in which women have equal opportunity to lead, 
participate in and benefit from. So if this is our end goal, let us be clear from what we are trying to transform. For us, this is an important po point because a transition pathway that does not transform the lives of those left behind is one that will only exacerbate inequality. So we're not just talking about transition, we're talking about transformation. The IA informed us that on average, there are 76% fewer women than men working in the energy sector and women working in the sector and 50% less than men, even when controlling for skill level. The UN Statistics Gender Snapshot 2022 states that affordable and clean energy, key to life-saving care and productivity, remains out of the reach of millions of women and girls in Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa. A report by Sustainable Energy for All that tracked energy finance commitments found that gender equality marked flows were a dismal 9% of the total development finance for energy projects and 93% of this funding came from only 10 government agencies. And for me, the most embarrassing is that SDG 7 is one of the, is one of the only six out of 17 SDGs with no specific gender indicators, according to a report by UN Women presented at the review of SDG 5 at the 2022 high, uh, UN High Level Political Forum. So the key question then becomes, if we do want to power a gender just and equitable inclusive energy transition, what do we have to do? The Gender and Energy Compact translates this question into a roadmap with six key outcomes. The first and paramount to us is to end energy poverty by increasing women's access to and control over sustainable energy products and services, most importantly for off-grid and clean cooking solutions but also by providing equal access to social protection mechanisms that minimize the risk of women for not being part of the energy transition. The second is to provide equal opportunities for women's career advancement in the energy sector so they enjoy decent and productive employment by energy firms and institutions adopting gender responsive workplace practices. Third, and this is where policymakers uh, convened uh, by IA play an important role is to formulate and adopt inclusive and gender responsive transition pathways, strategies and policies, and to facilitate gender parity in decision making platforms. Fourth is to exponentially increase gender smart investments and financing from governments, multilateral financing institutions and private sectors to, prime, to climate and energy pro programming but also to women-owned and led businesses. Fifth is the creation of uh, partnerships at local and international level to galvanize collaboration that accelerates and expands scale and scope of inclusive, bold energy impacts. Lastly, but definitely not least, and uh, this is where I'll conclude my um, first intervention, is to use gender transformation as a guiding roadmap for change and accountability making it mandatory to collect sex disaggregated data, tracking and reporting on gender KPIs in all energy and climate transition interventions for which gender and the energy data explorer uh, hosted by the, and formulated and hosted by IAA provides an excellent example and the IAA is to be congratulated for. Thank you, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Sheila. And maybe could I just ask you a first question because you're framing the issues very well there, but with your focus on Africa and Asia, would you see that a lot of the issues you're talking about are, are global or do you feel that the gender dimensions of clean energy transitions differ in different parts of the world? When looking at the statistics, the data and the statistics are clear that uh, uh, gender disparities in the energy sector across the globe um, um, uh, you know, affect each and every each and every continent, and each and every context. However, um, when implementing solutions, you do have to contextualize. So there are differences. We do have uh, countries that are reaching, for instance, 100% uh, electrification, where the issue is maybe less energy access, but more how to engage women in the energy transition. Uh, continents such as myself in Africa, the issue is still 
ending energy poverty. A lot of uh, women and other disadvantaged groups living in my continent just don't have energy access. So you can't even start talking about an energy transition. So indeed, when we look at gender disparities, they are um, across the globe. We don't see any um, continent, this is even in Europe, that are really performing well, um, but uh, they're context specifics. In Europe, for instance, in Eastern Europe, there's energy poverty. You might be surprised to know that women do cook with traditional biomass in a lot of Eastern European countries, particularly with, globing, with, the, uh, with the crises that we're now having with fuel, fuel and uh, um, um, uh, crises as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. And I think you're right. The framing of the current crisis has exacerbated a lot of issues, and I'm sure that will come up during the course of the conversation. Thank you. Let's turn now to Shara. So, uh, Shara, I hope, I'm, I hope I haven't uh, wrecked your name too much in my pronunciation, but I'm really grateful that you're here with us. Uh, thank you for joining us. Shara is the Deputy Director of Inclusive Green Growth Department at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and this department is responsible for Dutch foreign policy on a number of issues, including climate, water, food security, and energy. So really relevant to our discussion today. So Shara, maybe I can turn to you just to start by saying, maybe you could tell us a bit about what you are prioritizing in the Netherlands in terms of the issue of gender in the context of clean energy transitions, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Brian, uh, also for inviting me uh, to, this, um, uh, to this panel. A very uh, interesting uh, discussion and topic. Um, we face multiple similar challenges that we work on nationally and internationally. Um, first, we need to address the gender gap in clean energy access. Uh, I fully agree with uh, the previous uh, speaker. This is not only a priority in the Netherlands, where high energy prices especially impact women, but also in our foreign policy. Uh, the Netherlands has set an ambitious goal for SDG 7, where we aim to facilitate access to renewable en energy for 100 million persons in developing economies by 2030. And clean cooking is a very important part of, of this uh, objective. Um, this is one of the most fundamental energy needs, which is neglected by most gender blind policymakers. Um, because around the world, uh, daily cooking responsibilities are largely held by women and girls, and clean cooking can ease health problems and economic problems that disproportionately affect these women and, and, and girls. So it's an important part of our SDG 7 portfolio, but we, uh, it's, it's our um, aim to mainstream gender across our SDG 7 programs. Another example of the Dutch commitment is the Netherlands Energy Compact, which recently was set up by 30 Dutch private and public organizations focused on SDG 7. The Netherlands Energy Compact also focuses on increasing job opportunities for women and girls, which brings me to the second challenge. And, um, it was also referred to, I think, uh, by the uh, previous speaker. There is also a gender gap in the energy labor market. If we look at the Netherlands, Women represent only 22% 20, 20, of the working capacity in the energy sector. Uh, above the age 45, it's only 16%. Um, and uh, we haven't had the intention uh, to do something about it. And we have a human capital agenda to stimulate employment and education opportunities in the energy sector. Thirdly, uh, we feel there is a gap, we see a gap a gender gap in the energy in energy related education. Um, research shows that this is partly caused by stereotyping men as technicians and the absence of female role models, which is something that we can and should work on. Um, lastly, there's a gender gap in decision making. Uh, women should be involved in all the decisions that affect their lives and uh, but Unfortunately, women holding decision-making positions in the energy sector are far too low. In the Netherlands too, it's only 4%. We should actively give voice to women in international, national and local discussions. From a foreign policy perspective, this is also a strong message of the Netherlands in multilateral discussions, such as the G20 and here at the International Energy Agency. 
And uh, we, are, we are, of course, very happy with the fact that a gender advisory council uh, uh, was established. And to conclude, we, can, we cannot reach net zero and address these four challenges unless we consider the specific needs of women and, and, and involve and empower them to be the drive of transformational change. It needs to be transformational. I fully agree with the previous speaker on that. Thank you and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Shara. And maybe I could just ask you a question, if you didn't mind, because I had asked Sheila there about, about how, many, yeah. how much these issues were global. And, and she wisely said that, that the issues are often quite similar across the world, yeah. but maybe the solutions differ. And so yeah. from your perspective, working in the foreign ministry in mm -hmm. the Netherlands, what connections are there between your work on addressing these gender dimensions within the Netherlands itself and your international work on the same topic? Yes, I... So it, it's not always easy to interlink, uh, to, to link them, um, but there are very similar issues. And sometimes at the foreign ministry, yeah, we're so much focused on our programs and interventions abroad that we do forget about our own situation at home. Uh, and we can also learn from that. There's also a lot to learn uh, 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 from home. And there's, uh, like I said, uh, uh, I, I mentioned a, a, a couple of data which are not good for the Netherlands as well. So there's also a, a, a lot that we have to do at home. And um, so it should make us maybe also a bit modest in, uh, in, 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 in what we do abroad. Huh? There's also something that we need to, need to solve at home. Um, um, and I, I fully agree that it's, it's at the same time, it's, very localized. We do have a feminist foreign policy um, since 2000, uh, uh, since last year. And one of the key things there is that uh, we, we use the four, R, uh, the four R's, rights, representation, resources, and reality check. And reality check is very much focused on, it should be tailor-made. It should be linked to the local context in which you work. Thank you, Shara. Sheila, you wanted to come in on that? Yes, I just wanted to compliment what is said, and I have the advantage of actually living both in the Netherlands and in Zambia. <laughs> um, uh, having, uh, uh, I, I'm married in the Netherlands and I work in the Netherlands, but I, I, I come from I come from Zambia, and indeed there are interconnectivities. And I think where this, where my own personal experience is, where this is very real, is in the care economy. Um, Living in the Netherlands, when I went to the Netherlands, I thought it might be different, but I found that women still do take the main responsibility uh, for, uh, for care of, uh, of, uh, of the household and at home. And that has a key impact on your productivity and your work. Um, so the solutions are, are, uh, can be slightly uh, different. Whereas in uh, a country like mine in Zambia, we're really looking at labor saving technology uh, for a lot of our women still living in rural areas and using their own energy for that. In the Netherlands, we are looking for policies that are really going to um, ensure that more resources go to uh, ensuring that it's childcare, uh, that we have childcare um, and that allows women to enter, to re-enter into the workforce uh, faster and uh, not take the full burden, for instance, for part-time work uh, when you are trying to raise your children. So issues are the same, but the solutions can be slightly different. Um, and the energy sector, the, the numbers that we see in the energy sector for the lack of uh, participation is, um, is, um, 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 uh, has a direct link to the role that women play in the, uh, in, the care, uh, in the care economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheila. Let's turn now to Irena Gina Reichel. Uh, Irena is the co-founder and senior advisor of the Global Women's Network for Energy Transition, which was established in 2018 to connect and empower women working in sustainable energy across the world. Before that, in her career, Ms. Gina Reichel has held many positions, including Austrian ambassador to the People's Republic of China and to Brazil, as well as director general in charge of uh, the Austria's development policy and cooperation. So Irena, it's great to have you with us. And with that depth of experience, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the Global Women's Network, but also tell us why you felt having all the, the senior roles you, you took, that there, there was time in 2018 uh, for this global network to come into existence. 
Thank you very much uh, for having me at this uh, at this webinar and uh, um, congratulations to the International Energy Agency for all the groundbreaking work uh, they are doing, especially also in this in this area that we are discussing. Well, as the um, as the name says, the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition. One of the reasons why we founded this uh, network was that we were looking at the energy transitions that had been started by a number of stakeholders around the globe uh, by the time of two, 2017. And uh, we, we saw many political commitments and many uh, good statistics why um, renewable energy and energy efficiency are the way forward, etc. And yet we saw that the energy transitions were not really um, gaining momentum, uh, gathering up speed, the kind of speed that they need in order to, to really make a difference. And one of the reasons we thought was that um, the talent that humanity has is not fully employed to drive those transitions. And humanity's talent comes embodied in, in women and in men. And as uh, previous speakers have said very, uh, very well already, uh, we have this underrepresentation of women in the energy sector, which also uh, makes it very clear that uh, they cannot contribute with their life experience, which is different uh, than uh, different from the life experience of men, uh, they cannot uh, contribute fully to driving uh, this energy transition. This is an issue of human rights. Women are entitled to participate fully and on a par with men in all societal endeavors, in economy and uh, political decision making. Uh, uh, as a human right, but it's also something that should have an interest in as a society because uh, energy transitions are deep societal transformations. They are much more than just shifting from fossil fuels to renewable energy, and therefore they require a rethinking of how we work as a social fabric, and this rethinking has to uh, be able to draw on the best innovation that is available in a, in a particular society. And as I said, that innovation and that capacity for change and for driving that change is embodied in women and, and in men. So that's why we started the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition. And we are very happy to say that in the five years since its uh, founding, uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, international members, roughly 4,000. Uh, we are working mainly in the area of uh, mentoring, uh, of creating networks, of networks. We, we connect regional and national networks. Uh, we do knowledge transfer. And of course, we do advocacy to make this sector in general, more inclusive and more diverse. Thank you very much, Irena. And, and it sounds like really interesting work. And I, I have a number of questions that, which I hope we'll get to eventually. But first of all, let me start with one, which is because of your framing of the nature of the gender inequalities in clean energy, of course, they're quite, unfortunately, in the world we live in, quite similar to a description of gender inequality in many parts of the fabric of society. So do you think that the the gender dimensions and the gender challenges we face in clean energy are, shall I say, typical of societal gender inequalities or, or do they have unique attributes, would you say, in clean energy? I haven't found anything that is particularly specific to energy that wouldn't be present also, let's say, in disarmament or in diplomacy or, um, in some other fields where there is a male um, uh, dominance in terms of the numbers of, of, of people employed in it. I think what makes it different is that the energy transition uh, in the context of climate change, but also in the context of national sovereignty and, and human security 
is uh, an endeavor that all countries need to engage in. So uh, we, we, we do not have the leisure of saying, well, if this sector or that sector is a bit more um, unequal, it's bad, but nothing can be done about it. Here, it's, it's, it's an area, it's an endeavor that humanity as a whole has to embrace. And uh, uh, if we are not correcting the imbalances that are in the sector present today, we will carry over those imbalances into the future. We are now talking about skilling and skilling people that are employed in the energy sector, right? Now, if we are not bringing in new talent, people who are currently not employed in the energy sector quickly and swiftly and effectively, and that's mostly women and youth, then we will carry over the imbalances that we currently have into the new situations. And that will really uh, uh, be a lost opportunity for making our societies more equal and more just and more inclusive and more sustainable and more future. Thank you very much, Irena. Thank you for that. Let's turn next now to hear from uh, our next panelist, uh, who is Sherab Soy. Sherab, thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Sherab is the gender thematic focal point uh, of the SDG7 youth constituency. And we've heard, of course, SDG7 and the Sustainable Development Goals in general referred to several times. So it's great to hear about it more directly. Sherab is also currently uh, documenting her own transition to a green lifestyle, as well as working with elementary school children in Kenya to be more aware of energy and lifestyle choices. So, Sherab, I know we're going to learn a lot from you. And again, let me just start with a question because this is something you look at a lot. So in your perspective, what do you see as the state of the art of research about the gendered impacts of clean energy policies? Um, thank you, Brian, for having me. It's a pleasure to be among such an insightful panel, and I'm very much looking forward to this discussion. So um, something that maybe you might not have mentioned is currently I'm an analyst at CAMCO, which is a climate and impact fund manager. And my day-to-day -day activities and responsibilities are centered around supporting the multiple investment platforms we have, which are aimed at financing innovative solutions to address climate change and deliver a positive impact within the emerging markets. So this includes conducting research that is country and market research, which involves taking a deep dive into the country's political, social, economic um, environments, coupled with a thorough assessment of its energy policies. The recurring challenge that I have experienced is that there has been limited disaggregated gender data in the national and energy policies. We need this data to show the interlinkages between gender and energy and how these two play out in the employment sector, the financing sector, innovation sector, and so on. My observation and experience so far have been that when it comes to energy policies, particularly within these emerging economies, a majority of the time, gender is not included. And if it is included, it is mentioned as a co-benefit arising from the national policy plan. So this should not be the case, especially when gender plays a crucial role in actualizing the goal of universal energy access, as the previous panelists have mentioned. Data does form the foundation of the research. And when data is missing, when it's not easily accessible, or if it's not up to date, then how can we then rely on this data to accurately inform the company strategies, the national policies? Therefore, um, I think regular collection of the data together with public consultations should be taken into account and made available for policymakers to be able to assess the situation and develop appropriate evidence-based um, responses and policies. And as Ms. Irene rightfully mentioned, if we do not address the current imbalances, we cannot make the suitable change that is required. So gender and energy data explorer that was mentioned during the opening remarks could be one of the ways to address these challenges. So I'm looking forward to exploring this tool. I really do hope it's accessible and free. So yeah, when it comes back to my research fi findings, I can then provide an accurate baseline in the gender gap assessment to propose accurate solutions. 
um, that the company has to take and the solutions that actually match the society's real needs, gaps, and opportunities in relation to the energy sector. Thank you very much, Jarob. I'm very happy to confirm that the gender data tool is, is freely available to everybody. You can find it on our website. Um, and Sheriff, just talking about your work as an investment analysis, and of course the importance of data. How much does the, when you're when in your experience of investment analysis, how much is gender coming up as an explicit part of the discussion, part of the analysis? Um, like I previously mentioned, it doesn't come up a lot, quite a lot. It is touched on as a co-benefit, so that means uh, when you come when you analyze the policies, um, the gender perspective is seen as the beneficiary as opposed to um, being an integral part of the full cycle and the full process to make an overhaul of the, the change that is required um, to be implemented within the energy transition that's just and inclusive. Okay, thank you, Sharap, and I look forward to following up in just a minute. But before we do that, let's go to and hear from one more panelist, uh, who is Mini Govindan, who is joining us from India. And I think Mini, you're on the road, so we're delighted to uh, that you're able to connect with us uh, there in India. Mini is a senior fellow at Terry, which is the Energy Research Institute, a Delhi-based not-for-profit policy research institute that I'm sure many people are aware of, uh, specializing in energy, environment, and sustainable development. Mini has more than 10 years of experience working as an energy justice and energy gender nexus researcher. So Mini, we're delighted you're with us. Uh, and having heard what you have heard, but maybe uh, just based on your own experience as well, uh, especially regarding this issue in the context of a country like India or other emerging economies, maybe you could tell us a bit about how you see the implications of gender mainstreaming in energy policies. Yeah, thank you. And I'm glad to be part of this uh, very interesting panel. And uh, <clears throat> and also very glad that uh, the previous speakers had set a wonderful context. And, uh, uh, and I think by and large, we all agree that the differentiated energy needs of women and men, you know, coupled with the inherent disparities uh, in the social, uh, the cultural stance, and the condition general ro gendered roles, create the need for gender responsive measures uh, for equitable welfare. This is, this is something I think, which all the previous speakers has talked about and we all have a very common understanding. And then coming uh, you know, uh, to the uh, Indian context, uh, uh, it would be very inappropriate or incorrect to say that, you know, the gender mainstreaming aspects has not been considered at all. And if the importance of this mainstreaming aspect uh, uh, in energy projects or programs or policies has been acknowledged, uh, you know, to improve <clears throat> the benefits for both men and women. And also uh, over the years, you know, the, the whole concept of uh, uh, energy transition, energy justice, just transition, sir, the buzzwords, and it has caught the attention of, you know, policymakers, academia, uh, civil society, uh, the, even the uh, private players as a means of uh, achieving, you know, greater inclusivity and women empowerment. And you know to uh, quote some of uh, some examples and to you know kind of uh, explain it a little more better, I would like to quote some of the flagships uh, program that's been undertaken by the government and one being a very important uh, uh, program you know which uh, in which gender mainstreaming is something which has been considered. It's called the Rajiv Gandhi uh, Dramin Vidyut Karan Yojana. That's the rural electrification policy. And then we also have another uh, you know. Uh, an important policy called uh, the Saubhagya uh, scheme, you know, which is, uh, you know, talk, which talks about uh, providing uh, clean uh, cooking uh, solutions to the uh, uh, Indian uh, population. And in both of these uh, schemes, you know, uh, one of the Im uh, important aspect is the gender mainstreaming. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> this is something which has been very uh, uh, importantly considered in this policy, even in Saubhagya, that uh, you know it's mandated to give connections to women from underprivileged households, from women-headed households. So these are some of the very important aspects uh, that's been considered by the government. Even if you look at at the more you know. Uh, We've lost your sound there, Mini. Can you still hear us? It's uh, the... yeah, I can. Please go ahead. Sorry, you're back now. Yeah, and you know, even in this uh, uh, state of uh, Maharashtra, uh, it's uh, the whole aspect of gender mainstreaming has been very effectively uh, considered. Uh, where 
you know uh, women are mainstreamed into holding you know technical jobs through reservations through more proactive measures in terms of reservations and training and even if we look at the skill council of uh, green jobs in india which is again uh, undertaken by the government of india which has trained you know uh, uh, quite a significant lot of uh, women uh, into a technical uh, training and uh, this also includes uh, something like a uh, surya mitra so solar skill development program where uh, uh, around 25% uh, of the trainees are women and in some of the batches are uh, you know having uh, more than 50% of the female uh, uh, you know uh, attendees and in addition to all this It's the downside of having a speaker on the road. Sometimes the signal is good and sometimes the signal is not so good. Projects that are sponsored by the bilateral funding. We might need to mute Minnie there for a second, uh, Etienne, just so we can come back to her when we have a better signal. I think we better we better move to another speaker and come back to you, Minnie, when we can hear you a bit, a bit better. So, um, Sheila, I might go back to you if that's okay, um, um, because uh, Minnie was mentioning a couple of the examples there, and maybe I think it'd be useful if we if you uh, had a, a couple of examples, maybe if I put it this way, of your favorite policies where gender has been properly considered in the context of, of clean energy transitions. We'd love to hear those. Thank you. And um, so I'm going to use an, uh, an example that I consider uh, an energy that considers a uh, best practice approach. And that is taken from uh, 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 Cherop's country. Uh, the Ministry of Energy in Kenya in 2019 launched the gender and energy policy. And this is the first of its kind uh, policy in Africa where ministry has uh, at the uh, at the uh, at the ministerial level has an, a, a standalone gender and energy policy. And if you allow me, I'd just like to take us through the journey of how this uh, was, um, um, how this came about. I think this is really important because we read a lot of text and uh, you know, I, I myself I have a master's in, uh, in gender and rural development. So it's uh, in the books, it tells you, you know, what you have to do, but uh, how does this really uh, roll out in reality? Well, the first step that was undertaken by the ministry was to do a gender audit. And what they did is really just review a gender audit is that you do a, a, a gender assessment of the energy policy. They made it quite comprehensive. They looked at different organizations in the energy sector. They also looked at their strategies and they looked at the programs. And they did this so that they could understand, you know, what are the gender gaps and then what are the strategies that we need to do to address the gaps. What was really different from this is that this audit was done not by a consultant or by an NGO, which most gender audits uh, are conducted by, by, by the ministry's own staff. And yes, it did take uh, much more time because we, there was a need to build capacity and understanding of how to do a gender analysis. But the outcome of this was the real ownership and prioritization of the findings and recommendations coming out from the audit on the way forward. So I think for me, that's really one, identifying, you know, really uh, what is the, ev uh, uh, if you want to use an evidence-based uh, approach, you really have to do your research, identify what the issues, but make sure who's doing it is really important uh, and that ownership is built. But we recognize that changing policies and changing mindsets takes time. Um, it's not that you do your audit and tomorrow the policy is adopted. No, it does take time. So what do you do in between so that you don't lose that uh, 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 momentum? Uh, well, what happened in Kenya is that they, uh, a, a two, key, two, two key elements of their approach is that they established the Kenya Gender and Energy Network. And this provided a multi-stakeholder platform with NGOs that were involved, uh, um, uh, government was involved, private sector, but they used this platform to disseminate and share uh, with a wider audience, uh, you know, the findings from the, uh, from the audit. Um, the second, uh, very importantly, was to identify and support champions within the, uh, within the ministry. 
And these champions were at sufficient level of decision making to be able to convene and advocate for change from their principals and for their fellow colleagues and for others in the sector. Uh, very importantly through all this was really the messaging was key. And a key message here was that the current energy policy was, an, was likely to increase energy poverty among women if it continued to adhere to least cross criteria and ignore social culture dynamics. A third thing that was done, which I think was really important, is that they didn't want the gender uh, roadmap that they had proposed to be standalone. Uh, so they needed to demonstrate that it could be mainstreamed into conventional energy planning. And also they needed to build uh, the uh, evidence that taking a gender approach in implementation could really deliver on impact. So at the time there was the uh, sustainable energy for action planning. Those of us who have been along here in the energy sector for long enough will, will remember this an investment perspective. So really they tried to integrate gender into that process. And they also launched the uh, Women Economic uh, Empowerment Program to show impact. Finally, all these efforts accumulated into the ministry appointing agenda focal points. There was a lot of collaboration here with the Ministry of Gender. Unfortunately, in a lot of our countries, the gender machinery uh, is underfunded, doesn't really get engaged in the sectors. But in Kenya, they really try to engage it in the sector because the Ministry of Gender actually has the mandate to ensure gender mainstreaming across across all other sectors. So they uh, engaged in them and uh, our agenda focal point was seconded from the Ministry of Gender to the Ministry of Energy. And through that collaboration, as well as building on all the other efforts, um, uh, a gender and energy policy was launched uh, in uh, Kenya in November 2019. Currently, what's happening with the policy? Well, what's happening is that a step has been taken to translate the energy policy, which remains at that central level uh, into uh, county uh, energy plans and budgets. So that really it translates now into uh, implementation. Again, translating into implementation is to use the uh, energy policy as a platform to mainstream gender into other uh, 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 key implementation angles of the uh, agencies of the policies. For instance, into the uh, uh, Kenya Power, the utility into the Rural Electrification Agency, and also very important crossing over to the uh, to the climate and environment side into Kenya's uh, NDCs. Very importantly also was getting the funding, commitment and funding from budget. But because of the ownership, the level of ownership that was shown by the ministry, donors then came on board to support the implementation of the policy. And other actors are also, um, the, the government of the Netherlands supports the energizing development uh, program in Kenya, a very uh, important uh, program in Kenya on energy access, and they are also building on uh, the uh, intervention areas that are in the energy policy to roll out their programs. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you, Sheila. But let me just ask you, if I may, because it's a really interesting story you're telling us, but what's behind a success like that? Is it just a government has a particularly strong focus on gender or one or two individuals do, but what makes it happen there when it doesn't happen in other places? So I think that all of what you've said, I think the ownership by the government because of the approach that was used, it's not a consultant flying in, flying out. It's really getting government to do their own analysis, make prioritize their, uh, make their own priorities and to drive it. So I think ownership by government. Um, institutions are important, but at the end of the day, it's warm bodies and individuals. So indeed getting those champions and individuals is really important. Government cannot do this alone. Policies cannot be done. So building those partnerships with other stakeholders, with NGOs and civil society, uh, et cetera, uh, to support that is really important. Um, building political will and uh, through lobby and advocacy, which NGOs are very important, I think is, 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 uh, is, really, is really important. Um, uh, the data and the evidence, uh, but evidence that really shows the impact. Uh, so if you use a gender approach, you are indeed going to improve the development effectiveness of your energy programs because you're reaching the ones that need, uh, you know, the uh, the uh, that are most left behind was really important. So I think that was also uh, really key. So not just having a policy, but ensuring the policy is translated into implementation. And most importantly, not just remaining at a central level, that it has to be decentralized. It has to go to the local authorities. It has to go to the local level and getting them engaged. 
having the financing and budget behind that to back it uh, was really was really important. I think that's what has really made this a success. Thank you, Sheila. Shara, I might come back to you on a similar theme because you mentioned that the Netherlands has a principle of feminism in its policy making in this area. And maybe you could tell us a bit about that and, and how it goes from a statement of principle to actually influencing how policies are designed and as Sheila emphasized, implemented as well. How do we go from that being a statement to really changing what happens on the ground? Yes. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, yes, I must say um, it's not always easy to do so. Eh? To 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 go from that uh, that level uh, and 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 make it a reality. But uh, we have we, we try to apply a gender lens in all new policies and programs. And when it comes to programming. Um, um, we use a gender marker system and then we have to assess uh, uh, whether a certain program uh, is uh, 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 contributes in a significant or principal way to, to gender. So people within our ministry, uh, uh, my colleagues, they are obliged to think about it and ask themselves some questions. To what extent does, it in, does this program indeed benefit men and women in the same way or uh, and um, um, so doing these gender analysis and, and knowing how to do it is, is very important. And we have a task force of, uh, focused uh, uh, on, on, on women and, and gender equality, and they help us, uh, uh, they advise us to do these uh, analysis. Um, we also try to uh, make steps in terms of gender budgeting uh, uh, and, and, and making analysis to, 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 to what extent do our programs Actually, uh, uh, is is are the funds really going to to women or or, or men? Um, and we invest in capacity and knowledge development, uh, and we try to ensure a meaningful participation of women and and civil society organizations. So then we uh, get back to the point of involving women in decision making processes, and maybe another important aspect is our own organization. We should also really look at our own ministry and that's uh, where we also have set some targets in terms of representation uh, uh, how many uh, uh, female ambassadors do we have female directors etc um, and uh, that's that's also still something where we have to make a, a progress so not only looking at programming and, and things we do, but also looking at our own organization and how we could, could uh, transform that. Uh, uh, that's, that's really important, um, I, I would say. And um, getting back to also some, some previous speakers, I think Cherub uh, uh, mentioned the importance of data and, and, and research. And I would yeah, really uh, like to underline the importance uh, of, of, of that. It's not only making general analysis at the start, but also the importance of monitoring, evaluation, and learning throughout uh, the implementation. Is this program indeed having the effect that we aimed for, or should we adjust uh, 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 programming and our assumptions, uh, uh, perhaps? So monitoring, evaluation, and learning is very important. And also when we get to the Netherlands, we have um, an, an institute which is called 75 in Q. It's a center of expertise on gender and energy in the Netherlands, um, which provides us with a lot of interesting research and data to inform uh, uh, our policies nationally and also internationally. And I think we should aim for really practical tools that can help us and maybe also our partners. And one of the, the, the examples is um, Get Invest. It's funded by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs and it recently launched an online toolkit and research publication building the business case for gender inclusive financing in last mile renewable energy markets in sub-Saharan Africa. The purpose of this toolkit is to provide practical guidance for renewable energy companies, financial service providers, international development organizations, impact investors and donors to develop gender inclusive financial products and services. So I think those kind of tools really help us to make a difference. Thanks very much. And that toolkit sounds really interesting. But 
So can I ask you then, just you know, in the, in the same vein? Yeah. You're talking about a lot of kind of, let's say, shall we say, procedural changes or structural yeah. changes where you where you're building yeah. in better yeah. gender and the thing. Yes. Can that fix the problem, or is there still always a danger that it slips off the prioritization agenda? How much do you think it needs this kind of constant political leadership, constant focus, it, or how much can it be hardwired in? Do you think? I think it needs constant political leadership, indeed. Because I think a lot of people, they sus subscribe to uh, the, the idea of having uh, gender as a priority. But to make it really happen, it needs really attention and conscious decisions. It doesn't happen uh, uh, by itself. So leadership is extremely important. And that's why I think this, like this feminist foreign policy to which our um, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, our Minister for Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation, they have uh, committed themselves to it. I think that's already very, very important that uh, really from the top level, the message is being given, this is what we want and we think this can make a difference. And it doesn't only make a difference in terms of gender, but um, uh, our intention is also to like um, have a more systemic change um, in which also other groups um, or uh, yeah, groups that are that may be uh, marginalized or um, that it will also have a positive change uh, on, on, on them. So uh, yeah, political leadership is extremely uh, in, in important. At, and I, I would say at all levels, it's in, it's important yeah, to make it sure. And in that sense, it should also, uh, uh, it may also uh, be needed to make it part of like um, job profiles and uh, also um, performance appraisals, etc. Yeah. Thanks, Shara. And Irena, I see you nodding there, so I might go back to you on a similar question in terms of where you think the key intersection points, if you like, are where we can make best practice more normal here. Well, I think uh, it can be done um, uh, uh, on, on a long uh, uh, list of interventions and all the stakeholders have their role to play. Since we are talking about um, systemic discrimination, which often is unconscious, but it is still systemic, uh, rules and frameworks obviously play a role and they have to be set at the appropriate levels by the government, by the uh, corporations, by the head of the, the corporation, etc. Uh, and then they have to cover all uh, the areas of the uh, um, of the the value chain, if you want, in, in sustainable energy. So it has to do uh, with how uh, recruitment takes place. It has to do with how uh, women are able to advance or not in, in uh, once they have entered a company. We have lots of statistics that show that at the entry level, uh, women are doing quite well um, together with men. But then as, as uh, uh, men are promoted through the ranks of organizations and of corporations, women are left behind for whatever reasons, because there is a difficulty to reconcile family obligations and work obligations, or because you know, the, the, the uh, system kicks in whereby a man hires again a man when it comes to a promotion. This is very widespread and it's not uh, restricted to any cultural area or to any region, whatever. We see this in, 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 in all areas. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the issue of making work and family responsibilities more compatible, I think is a very important one mm -hmm. uh, because in practically all the cultures that I know, it's, it's women who uh, do the, the major caring work in, in, in society, they care for kids, they care for uh, the, the old ones, the sick ones, etc. And uh, that has been reinforced by the Corona crisis even, even further. So to create work rules that allow a better uh, uh, sharing of these work responsibilities is, is a very important, uh, a very important issue. But then we also have to take measures to specifically promote 
women and to help them develop their potential to catch up basically in those uh, situa situations of institutional um, uh, unlevel playing field. And uh, we also have to bring in new talent and we have to uh, make sure that the, the pipeline is filled with new talent, which means that we need to go to students, we need to go to young girls before they make uh, their career choices. And we need to present the sustainable energy sector as a sector that is attractive for women and has something to offer for women. Thank you very much. Thank you. If I could ask you a, a follow up question, because we're talking about things that should be done, but often aren't done. So it, it, would it be if this is not too general a question, Irena, to say um, when we see gender not adequately addressed in, in some of these clean energy policies, is it that we're making design failures, we're not using good data, or we're simply it's simply not occurring to those policymakers to to put a specific focus on gender. Why do you think the 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 failing comes in most? No. You're on mute there, Irena. Sorry. I I believe a lot is being done. Simply not enough. A lot is being done, and all kinds of uh, stakeholders from all kinds of ends but it's not systematic and it's not deep uh, reaching enough. Thank you. Sharab, could I go back to you? Because uh, because in your role with the SDG7 youth constituent, it seems to me when I hear a statement like, uh, we're not thinking enough about the effects of these policies on women, or we're not consulting women's voices enough in the in these debates, I could replace the word women with young people. So do you see that these issues are quite similar in terms of the underrepresentation of women and youth in, in these discussions? Yes, um, I feel like, yes, it's, it's true to say that there is underrepresentation, but on the flip side, there is also um, lots of great efforts and yeah from the young people and the women together so maybe I can just highlight the importance of gender in the youth agenda and maybe it can paint a clear clear picture that um, first the importance is to build capacity for a just and inclusive transition we've had it being mentioned in the previous intervention that we need a new pipeline of fresh um, talent and this is sort of to bank on the future. So we need to shift the narratives and have a qualified workforce that can take up the challenges and channel resources in building the innovative knowledge and the new ways of thinking required to address not only the gender gaps, but also the energy transition. And we also need to continue to raise awareness on not just the pending progress, but the ongoing contributions that are making a difference. And discussions such as this, like bringing different contexts and different perspectives in highlighting probably the learnings in Netherlands, the 75 NQ, and networks such as the Global Women's Network um, on the energy, and also Sheila's elaboration on what contributed to the success on the policy in gender policy in Kenya. So as young people and as young females who are looking to get the entry point into the sector or like um, take the next level within the sector, it is important to hear from different voices and see what the gaps are um, present, presenting themselves as and also to see how we can align ourselves with the opportunities depending on where we want to be at the end. No, I'm doing it. Sorry. Thank you, Shara, for that. Uh, Minnie, I'd like to go back to you, and I want to check if you can hear us okay there. Minnie, are you hearing us? Yes, I am. I am. And am I audible? Yes, you, we can hear you very well. Thank you. So, sorry, we lost you a little bit earlier, but I, I hope you've been hearing the discussion, and I wanted to come back to this theme about what are the, let's say, drivers of success uh, versus lack of success, because we've heard a couple of really interesting examples from different parts of the world. And when we heard you last, you were telling us about some of the interesting work done at national and state level in India. So maybe you could, whether it's about uh, saying, you know, why it has, has worked in some cases, not in others, why some states are, are doing better than others, but what what do you see is the, the di difference in driving success versus failure when you look at different approaches? 
um, yeah, I mean, that's quite interesting. And that's something, you know, which we have also been trying to understand. And very often it is said that, you know, a lack of women in technical positions, in technical education is one of the reasons, you know, for their non-representations in major energy decision-making bodies. But a very closer uh, look into the data shows that India has the highest number of women as STEM graduates. That's in science, engineering, you know, technology, mathematics, and, you know, which is surpassing several developed nations. Even if you look at the data from the National Institute of Wind Energy, uh, it clearly shows that, you know, women in research fields, especially in emerging areas like data analytics and, you know, and some of the decision making, uh, there are around 65% of uh, women uh, researchers in the area. So the, uh, the obvious question that comes is even uh, that even with so much progress happening, you know, why is women's visibility and their active role in this entire, you know, energy transition debate uh, is uh, so elusive. And why is it debatable? You know, we have so much of data to say that, you know, uh, so much of capacity building has been done, awareness has been done, women participation has been high in skill development. But then where are they? So we started, you know, uh, uh, analyzing this and started going and even talking to all this, uh, you know, training institutes, government bodies to uh, to uh, try and check where are the women who have undergone all this training bodies and all those things. Analysis, uh, unfortunately, is condensed into a very narrow definition of gender binary approach, where everything is just reduced to, you know, number of men participating, number of women participating, number of women trained, number of women who has benefited from training, policies, projects, education, entrepreneurship, and, you know, I mean, all of this. But when, uh, but, uh, you know, and another thing is, there are no data, I should say, there is no data to see that the women who have utilized this training, this capacity buildings, have they put that training into any practical use? And what are the, have they put that to pursue a livelihood? Have they put all the capacity building to, uh, in any of the decision-making uh, mechanisms? So uh, our own analysis shows that, you know, many a times women after, you know, undergoing all those training, skill development are not able to utilize the opportunities, uh, you know, due to structural barriers. And that's something which we also see in terms of, you know, uh, energy developers and implementers, you know, most of them are faced with the requirement of gender inclusion. I mean, perhaps it is mandated by donors, you know, and they, uh, most often, you know, opt for easy route of turning women into namesake beneficiaries. I mean, I, and though they cannot be blamed entirely for this because uh, they also work with, you know, constrained timelines and uh, limited budgets and limited mar margins. And, you know, so uh, that leaves very less room uh, for additional investments for actual gender mainstreaming across the uh, project uh, cycle. So this whole uh, notion of, you know, gender binary, uh, is something which uh, is where we uh, personally have, uh, you know, a problem with. And this gender uh, binary also endorses certain, uh, you know, concepts uh, where, uh, you know, men possess oppositional and complementary identities. And while women are, uh, you know, as all other speakers have said that, you know, they're more into caring and uh, homemaking. And uh, so this kind of a binary is something uh, which uh, promotes uh, gender essentialism. And that's something I think uh, we have uh, been problem because, for instance, you know, uh, in India, it's a, it, a, the, the common notion of a progressive society, you know, that promote women empowerment, also encourage women to be a solar engineer. But at the same time, it will also constrain women from traveling to remote areas for work because they think, you know, it might compromise their uh, duties as a homemaker. So on one hand, you are a progressive society encouraging a woman to be a solar engineer. But when a woman actually becomes a solar engineer, you have other barriers by saying that, oh, you should not travel to, uh, you know, far off uh, areas that will compromise your duty at home. You can't care for the uh, children, elderly. So women are technically qualified, but still not being able to put uh, their qualification into proper use. So this is something I would like to highlight because a lot of things on paper is gender mainstream, but in practice or actually on ground, you don't find them. Yes. Thank you very much, Minnie. And I, I must say, I'm hearing uh, 
in many responses, the interconnectivity of these gender issues, well, you know, that, that come up in many parts of society in structural and practice ways, as well as, you know, issues that might be specific to clean energy, but there don't seem to be that many issues that are specific or unique to clean energy, but they touch on the wider dimensions of gender disparity and gender inequality. So colleagues, we just have a few minutes left, so I'm very happy to hear from any of you if you have particular points you want to make or respond to anything you've heard. I'll also try and squeeze in a question or two from our audience, but first I'll go to you, Sheila, please. Yes, no, I just um, I just wanted to bring something in from our real life experience and uh, maybe just first to say that uh, the, uh, the toolkit uh, that our colleague from the Netherlands mentioned was actually developed by energy with support from uh, from uh, from getting that. So we're really pleased to see that it is uh, it's been read and it's been uh, acknowledged and um, we're quite excited with the findings coming from it um, uh, being used. But one of the key things that we found from Energia's own practical experience, because we work with uh, we work with policymakers, but we also work with big programs like Endev. Uh, we're currently working with um, uh, with um, the uh, Netherlands um, Enterprise Agency in their. Um, um, uh, uh, in their big uh, clean cooking uh, program to support um, uh, um, uh, the energy ecosystem in, uh, uh, in clean cooking. And one of the challenges that we find is where gender comes in. Uh, that unfortunately it does not come necessarily in at the beginning, it comes in uh, later on. Um, and so there's a lot of resistance uh, from those that are going to uh, implement to take it on board because plan budgets have already been set, plans have already been made, resources have already been allocated. So the gender is really coming in as an, as, as an extra. And this is why within Energia we have, we're becoming much more vocal in saying, let's make gender KPIs within the energy sector uh, mandatory. Uh, the climate sector is doing this. Uh, in the climate investment funds, they have a gender action plan. It is mandatory for whoever's receiving funding or engaging in climate uh, investment funds to have gender KPIs. Uh, in the energy sector, and very much in the energy transition, let's start making this mandatory. Uh, you don't, if you don't measure something, it's forgotten. It's not visible and it's forgotten. Um, uh, when, it, uh, when it starts being measurable, you need, to be, uh, you need to be responsible for it in delivering on it, and you need to allocate resources. So for us, one of the key challenges is where it comes in, that it tends to come in much later um, and it's not necessarily set as, and also it comes in more as a voluntary, a voluntary commitment, you have to do it. Um, and um, um, yes, and I think for those of us working in the energy sector, including with Energia, it's maybe how we package it. I think really making, building the business case and a lot more is happening, like we heard from other speakers, uh, uh, there's a lot more evidence being put about how to package it. I think the toolkit is a very good example where we really specifically target the toolkit for uh, financial institutions and for uh, invest and investors. Um, so we um, uh, engaged and tried to understand what they need, what their work is doing, and what is going to be the business case to get them on board. Uh, so I think packaging our messages, our tools, um, uh, making them man much more hands-on, hands-on, specifically targeted for uh, different uh, for different skill sets for different centers is really going to be important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheila. Chara, over to you, please. Um, thank you, Brian. I mean, after listening to all these interventions um, and the different perspectives, I think I would like to reemphasize the youth perspective. And this I can share through the con give context using my personal journey from a youth perspective and also a gender perspective. And this starts with the history of the SDG7 youth constituency and how it came about, and also its role in progressing the youth agenda as it progresses the energy sector. So the, this emerged, the constituency emerged from the gap where young people needed um, a central engagement mechanism for them to take action and gain experience within the sector. So there was already action taking place, but it was happening in isolation. So in 2020, the constituency came to be and provided that much needed space. Almost immediately, we could see the interest in the membership and the numbers as it consists consistently grew and the work streams were active all year round. But 
what was striking to observe was that 60% of the leadership team at that time was female, which is very different from the statistics that um, Sheila, I think, initially gave during her first intervention on women's participation. And this was like a reflection of what the youth mind frame is at. So it expressed that within the youth circles, young females are not shying away from taking even the leadership positions. And when you have a gender balance at the coordination level, you get this more diverse range of opinions and strategies. And that's exactly what happened. So initially I was part of the 60% and started out as the energy access focal point. In this capacity, I got to understand most of the challenges which we've mentioned just during this discussion about the unique region, specific obstacles that were getting in the way of actualizing universal energy access. But as the first two years went by, and from the look of things, we had significant progress in the constituency. Um, according to its mandate, we had youth engagement, we had youth publications, um, we were gathering the best available scientific data to support the work of youth movements. But in our view, there was something missing especially um, after actively working on energy access. Um, we had the gender topic, but it wasn't like fully ingrained. So it was clear enough to us that a just and inclusive transition would require all hands on deck. And this meant the voices of the young people, the women, the indigenous communities. And so we came to the conclusion that despite the gender related topics starting to take center stage, um, there was still a lot of Pending progress, which is why we dedicated an entire working stream towards gender related topics um, at all levels. So I've had like um, most some of the panels asking, where do we find this young talent? Where do we find this fresh perspective? So if you're ever in need to find young talent, please reach out to the SDG 7 Youth Constituency. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Sharap. And I can certainly attest from our interactions with the SDG 7 Youth Constituency, we've benefited a lot from the wisdom and commitment of many people around the world. So I think it's a really excellent platform and congratulations. So Shara and Minnie, I just want to check if there's any last remarks or input you'd like to make before we close up. Yes, Shara, yeah. if, if, if I may. Um, yes, there are uh, two other things that I uh, uh, would like to uh, mention. And for the energy transition uh, towards uh, renewable, renewable energy, um, I would like to uh, uh, point out that uh, this requires other competences and skills than uh, uh, used to be the case in uh, the, the fossil uh, um, uh, uh, era. And so we need to focus our education on that. And that's it. I already referred to the human capital agenda in the Netherlands, which is really focused on uh, um, uh, uh, adjusting our education and um, uh, mobilizing the, the, the right skills. Another important issue is mining, and we haven't referred to it. For uh, renewable energy, a lot of raw materials are needed. And in the mining sector, um, uh, we also need to look at the roles of women. There are a lot of women involved, especially in artisanal mining, and uh, women are more likely than men to experience negative effects from their work in the mining sector. Uh, uh, exclusion from jobs, sexual harassment, dealing with water, land and air pollution caused by mining. And uh, we're also working on, 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 on that. And together with the organization Women's Rights and Mining, we are organizing a, a session. We will be organizing a session on this uh, at the OECD Minerals Forum uh, on the 26th of April. So uh, uh, I'm not quite sure uh, to whom it will be open who, um, or whom will be there, but it might be an interesting um, uh, um, meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shara. Both really interesting points and both both topics we hope to return to in this series and in our discussion around skills and particularity. But I think what you're saying there about mining and the particular issues around informal workers where women are much more heavily represented, I think are really important. Thank you. Minnie, I'm going to give the last word to you. Yeah, thank you. So I would uh, like to uh, say uh, one thing is like, we need to somehow break this compartmentalized, you know, binary views that perpetuate a non egalitarian gender ideology. And uh, as uh, Sheila has been uh, emphasizing, you know, we need to come up with more uh, stronger uh, tools, more uh, stronger guidelines and frameworks where we need to capture the actual, you know, gender uh, impacts and outcomes and which goes beyond 
you know reporting in terms of numbers yeah yes thank you i think that's a wise point to end on and i think you know we certainly heard across from all the speakers we've heard some really good interesting examples emerging of good practice but we've heard a lot of emphasis on the importance of data and uh, that we build up better data sets we have better evidence but i also think the role of discussions like this where we exchange experience uh, are really important and certainly from my perspective i've learned a lot from all of our speakers sheila shara cherup irena and mini i want to thank you all it's been really excellent discussion and to all of us who've jo who you joined us online uh, thank you for spending the time with us i hope this has been interesting and useful to you i hope you'll join some of our future events and do please get in touch with the team at the iea if you want to engage share your experience and data with us and then continue in this conversation so with that we'll close our webinar today thank you everybody for joining us thank you in particular to our speak speakers for your time and your inputs thank you <laughs>